Folks, well, it's 7 o'clock, so welcome to tonight's Farminar. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I am Steve Carlson. I work, I'm a staff member at Practical Farmers of Iowa, and I'll be your, your Farminar host tonight. And tonight's Farminar topic is walk-in coolers. And after I do a quick introduction here about Practical Farmers of Iowa, I'll turn it over to our first speaker, Tim Landgraf of One Step at a Time Gardens. Tim's going to talk about the different coolers that his farm has had over the years and offer some tips and things to consider when planning for and using a walk-in cooler. And next up we have Tony Thompson from New Family Farm and Tony's going to tell us about the walk-in cooler that he built on, uh, on his farm recently. So we do these about every Tuesday night during the fall and winter months. Looks like we've got two left for this season and if you've missed any of the last couple weeks you can go to our archive. All of these are recorded. We have just over a hundred in our in our archives, so you can go dig through the archives if if you're looking for a topic that you missed. There's a lot of good stuff in there. And tonight is being recorded, so if you want to go back through the presentation tomorrow or some other time, you can check there for tonight's recording as well. So if you're not familiar with Practical Farmers of Iowa, we started back in 1985. This is we just have been celebrating our 30th anniversary over the last year. We are a nonprofit organization that's made up of farmers and friends of farmers. And our farmers come from farms of all sizes and enterprises and from across the state of Iowa and, and far beyond. The mission of Practical Farmers of Iowa is strengthening farms and communities through farmer-led investigation and information sharing. And this mission allows us to, to help farmers practice an agriculture that benefits both the land and the people. PFI's values include welcoming everyone, creativity, collaboration, and community, viable farms now and for future generations, and stewardship and ecology. You can join Practical Farmers of Iowa if you're not already a member. Um, your membership will allow you to tap into our network of uh, diverse and active farmers and non-farmers across the state. You'll get all our newsletters, discounts to our events, and the opportunity to participate in our on-farm research projects and all of our programming. So even though we just had our beginning farmer retreat and our annual conference, um, and our, our field days still don't start for another uh, couple of months, but there's still a lot on our calendar. So if you're looking for something to do, check out the event calendar on our website. And uh, that's full of uh, PFI events and non-PFI events. So um, you can you can check that out when you get a chance. So a little bit about the rules real quick. Um, thanks everybody for entering your location and into the chat box along with your email address. Like I said, we collect that info for grant reporting. And if you want to help guide the topics for next season's Farminar, then um, we'll be in touch through email. Also, yeah, I guess it looks like this isn't working. Let me try and reopen. There is a poll on the bottom left corner. Um, that uh, that we'd like you to to check if there's multiple people watching from your from your connection, then it's good for us to try and keep track of that just to know how many people are coming in. So I'm going to pull up Tim Landgraf's presentation here and let Tim take it over. Um, if you do have questions for our presenters tonight, go ahead and uh, type them into the chat box at any time. If the speakers um, see your question and they want to address it, then they'll go for it. Otherwise, I'll make sure that we circle back and get to your question in the final 30 minutes of this uh, of this 90 minute farminar. So thanks again for joining us everybody. Very good. Good evening everyone. This is Tim Landgraf and um, I'm going to be start leading us off here when we talk about our coolers and uh, some things to think about when uh, getting ready to, to, to either expand or start in on your first cooler. And uh, first thing I'm going to do is uh, talk a little bit about our farm and what we do. Um, we're, again, as Steve said, uh, I farm with my wife, Jan Libby, up here in north central Iowa. We're in southern Hancock County. Uh, one step at a time gardens. So I'll give a little, little overview of what we do. 
Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit more specifics about storage, um, some post-harvest ideas in, in handling those fruits and vegetables, and then the temperatures and humidities. Um, then I'll walk you through our history of uh, coolers that we've gone through here at OSTG and then talk a little bit about specifics in terms of shelving thoughts and, and storage containers. Um, so the overview for our farm, we're a full season vegetable farm. Um, we have currently about six acres in vegetable production and cover crops. Um, not every, not all of our fields are in production every year. We do use cover crops on some of the fields and rotate around. We have about three quarters of an acre um, in clover, and that again rotates through our our system. And we run our broilers. And we do some pastured poultry uh, out on that clover. Our primary markets for our crops. We do CSA, Community Supported Ag. Um, this will be our 21st year in production this year for the CSA. We have six drop sites in North Iowa. Uh, we also do some fall and winter shares in November and December. Um, and then we have some targeted wholesale accounts. And the three primary wholesale crops we grow are winter squash, carrots, and potatoes. Um, so in talking first, when you're getting root, thinking about uh, doing some post-harvest storage, and I'm, I'm talking here both in short-term storage and long-term storage, um, some things to keep in mind, and that's, that's the product itself that you're putting into that storage. Um, some good advice is to avoid product that has blemishes on it or bruises. Um, if that product goes into your cooler with that blemish um, and you haven't sorted that out, Oftentimes, that'll be your first place where you'll start to have some rapid deterioration, and that can then lead to spoilage of that whole container. So it's a good idea to sort those out before you put product into storage um, so you don't run into those kind of problems. Um, another good idea is to minimize the handling of the product when you put it into storage. You know, again, there, in some cases, um, it's unavoidable. You have to go through and, and do some work to do the sorting, but uh, try to think through the process of, of what you're doing with that product after you harvest it to minimize the amount of times it gets handled. That'll reduce the amount of bruising and, and the amount of uh, droppage and that sort of thing that could happen. And then I'm going to talk, uh, we've got a couple of slides here. We're going to talk about hydrocooling or curing. And those are two, a couple of different techniques of dealing with a couple of different types of product to kind of uh, prep, prepare the product for putting in the storage. Um, so let's go on and talk about those specifically. The hydrocooling is a technique where you're going in and lowering the core temperature of the product. Um, essentially, the idea is, you know, you, when you bring product in from the field, you want to remove the field heat from the product um, and and get it down to the storage temperature as quickly as possible. Now, in some cases, folks will use icing uh, if you have the availability of an ice machine and you can make that happen um, to lower it. What we do on our farm is uh, we do hydrocooling, which amounts to uh, we immerse the product in our well water coming right out of our well. Um, we have a series of tanks where we can do that. It rapidly cools the product off. We'll, we'll immerse it, leave it in there for a while. Um, in some cases, we may have to do a couple of dips, but normally we just do just one. Um, and uh, monitor that temperature if we have multiple batches of product coming in. So we'll flush out the water and refill it again to, to maximize that uh, cooling of the product. It reduces the respiration of rate of the product that you've harvested. Um, and again, you can do that either by spraying or immersing. We do immersing. Um, the best crops that works on the leafy greens, uh, the brassica crops, the rope crops, radishes, beets, carrots, they all respond really well to hydrocooling. On the other end of the spectrum is storing the product at a high temperature for a minimum amount of time to dry the surface or cure the product. That's why it's called vegetable curing. You're basically heating the product up or putting it in a warm place, um, typically a warm and dry place, to uh, cure that product. Um, now, we do this on garlic. We do it on storage onions. Uh, sweet potatoes and winter squash. 
Um, some some cases like storage onions, you can uh, if you happen to hit a spill when the when you're uh, harvesting the storage onions, you can pull them from the ground so you you break that root contact. And sometimes you can still do that right in the field if you hit a worm spill. We tend to pull them out of the field, put them inside our hoop house so that uh, we get them warmed up and get them in a dry space so we don't have to worry about dews and we don't have to worry about rain coming in. So we do that, that uh, curing. And that just helps uh, get the product set so then it'll, it'll, you'll get your maximum amount of storage time when you actually put it in storage. So let's talk a little bit about uh, storage temperatures and the humidities. Now I've got a series of three charts here, um, and and I'll in a little bit I'll show you where this information comes from. But these are some commonly uh, held storage temperatures and recommended, I should say, storage temperatures and humidity for some common common crops that are going to be grown in the vegetable gardens. Um, First thing I want to point out is you'll notice for the temperatures, these I've grouped these all. These are products that are going to be in that uh, I call very cool range, the 32 to 34 degree range, um, or 35, 36 degree range. Um, so this is a pretty cold storage temperature to, to keep these. Um, the other thing to note is the humidity. Um, you'll note that the humidity levels here I'll drag the little arrow over here, and you'll see they're all pretty high humidity levels, except when you get down here to the garlic and the storage onions. So um, what that means, if you were to put those, say, in a, in a large walk-in cooler and you weren't doing anything to control humidity, you may have, uh, just by chance, you may have a high humidity environment, but most likely you won't have a high humidity environment. Most coolers, um, they have... Um, fans and, the, and they have, uh, you know, their cooling mechanisms and they tend to dry the air out a little bit just like you would have inside your refrigerator. Um, and so it can to, tend to dehydrate the product unless it's somehow sealed in a container or uh, put in a bag or something to keep the humidity up or unless you're introducing humidity into that space. Um, now with the garlic and the onions, um, you might get by just fine storing those without any kind of... Uh, environment and in fact if you were to seal them up in a container most likely you're going to run into problems with some rotting going on because it'll be too humid so those are some uh, things to keep in mind when you're looking at these crops you, you know you'll notice most of the crops here are your leafy greens these are some a lot of the spring crops or, or fall crops the later fall the broccoli you can do as a fall crop um, and then a lot of the allium family um, that are in that um, down here on the cantaloupe, I want you to note it's an ethylene gas producer. So ethylene gas is a, is a product of the natural ripening of the fruit. And so if you store a significant quantity of that in with some other crops, it can have a tendency to uh, actually uh, deteriorate the condition of those other crops. Um, carrot is a good example. If, if a carrot is stored in an area where you've got a high ethylene gas, It'll actually make the carrots bitter. They'll, they'll taste really terrible. It really, uh, really ruins the carrot in terms of its uh, ability to make it pleasant to eat. So that's something to keep in mind um, and to watch out for. Those ethylene gas producers, you want to either store them separately or have space set up that you can deal with that, uh, getting rid of that ethylene gas. Um, okay, so let's go on to the next one. These... Uh, these you'll notice now the temperatures are more in this cool but not cold range. We're in the 45 to 60 degree range. Um, this tends to be a lot of the summer crops, the high summer crops, beans, green beans, uh, cucumbers, tomatoes, if you're going to cool those, zucchinis, uh, and then some of the you know late season potatoes and winter squash, sweet potatoes. Um, so, you know, one thing to point out there is to say, well, okay, people often ask, well, can I just get one cooler and make it work for all of the crop? Well, it's not ideal. You're going you're gonna to sacrifice either the product on uh, one end or the other. If you find something in the middle, um, you're going to lose some, some storage life, um, either by being too cold or you're going to be not cold enough. Um, so it really... Uh, you know, you, on a short-term basis, you know, it'll you can get by, but it's not a good idea to do that. 
um, it's, it's better if you can set up a regime where you've got a couple of different temperature environments uh, if you're going to be storing product from both groups. Um, the humidity levels, again, you'll notice they're, they're pretty high except for the winter squash. Um, and winter squash is not going to not going to store real well if it gets again in that high humidity environment. You'll start to have rot issues, uh, but the others they're going to be pretty high. Um, and the last slide I have are some fruits, fruit crops. Um, and again, you can read through those. Those tend to be pretty cold uh, in the temperature range, uh, pretty high humidities, and quite a few of them you note are ethylene gas producers. The ones that I've starred are, are all going to be those ethylene gas producers. So uh, again, the fruiting environment tends to be uh, something that has to be uh, either kept separate or, or uh, to get that ethylene gas dealt with. Now this data that uh, I've just shown you, it's coming from the sources I've listed on the bottom. Um, I've given you a few websites here to look through the two bottom ones, this, uh, the, this is the UC Davis website and then the USDA website. Those are both good sources. You can get a lot of good information out of that. It's just the information I was just presenting and, and used to pull from. It'll have other vegetable crops if they weren't on the list that I gave. Another good source is this Wholesale Success. Uh, this is a book that's, uh, I believe it's in its third or fourth edition now. Um, we, ours we have is the first edition, but I, we still refer to it. There was a lot of folks involved uh, in putting that book together. Um, this familyfarmed.org organization uh, is, is kind of the, that's where you go to find it and to, to purchase that book. So it's a good reference. It talks about, uh, again, uh, how to do that post-harvest handling, some tips on the, the, the different um, whether it's, again, you're doing the cooling of the product or curing of the product, it gives times and temperatures for doing that curing uh, in that book. So that's a good place to look for that information. So on to post-harvest cooling at one step at a time. So we uh, went through a series of coolers. When we started out, we were fairly small. Um, we started out with just uh, friends and doing a handful of shares and, and fairly quickly moved up in scale um, and found as we got bigger, we needed a veg bigger vegetable cooler. And so we started out with a farm egg cooler. This was something we found on a, a garage sale. It's a box. I'll show you a picture of it. But there's some dimensions of the interior of the box that was used historically for cooling farm eggs. Uh, once we outgrew that, I built a small um, walk-in cooler, again, here are the dimensions, and then eventually we purchased a modular uh, walk-in cooler. This was, uh, some folks may have had these or seen these, it's a, it's a cooler that has some modular panels um, that they lock together and then you can caulk the cracks, um, and you kind of just build the sections together to make the big box. So I have some pictures of that. Uh, so I have a question. Any thoughts about the need for a standby generator for the walk-in cooler? Um, so it depends on the stability, I, from my perspective, stability of your power supply. Um, we have never had a standby generator for our walk-in coolers when uh, over the couple of times that we have lost power on the farm. Um, it's typically been in the winter months when we've had ice or something like that. We have not, we've had the fortune that we've not lost temperature during the summer or lost power during the summer. Um, so we've never, never really have had that uh, experience where we've run into that. And considerations regarding children getting trapped in the walk-in cooler. That's a good question. Um, on our coolers, we have built into the door, it's a push button. Um, that pushes on the doorknob itself so that you can open it from the inside so you uh, you can't you know theoretically can't get trapped at least if you can reach the button to push uh, it's just a, a rod that then pushes against the handle to open the door up from the inside um, so some pictures so this is a picture of our egg cooler uh, I've calculated the internal volume there based on the internal dimensions um, this operated about 50 degrees, and uh, we very quickly ran out of size. Uh, we ran, it wasn't big enough for our needs. Um, so within a couple of years, actually, we needed something bigger. So I went and built this 
piece here, and that's um, you know you see it here in the in the plywood. Um, it's right next to the egg cooler is over here sitting to the side, but, but this is the walk-in cooler. Um, it's about triple the size of storage capacity, but again, I, it operates in this 45 to 55 degree range. Um, so it, it was convenient for those summer crops, the, again, what I call the cool, but not the cold temperature crops. Uh, didn't really work well, well for that. For instance, when we would put broccoli in here in the spring, um, very short, very short, shelf life and pretty quickly within a day or two we would have browning of the broccoli uh, because it wasn't cold enough and so the broccoli was continuing to to uh, ripen if it will and, and so it very quickly lost its shelf storage um, so not very ideal so then uh, we went to, oh before I go on to the third one I'm going to talk a little bit about how we cool that so this, uh, this device here, um, this is the top on the outside of the cooler, and it actually fits through a hole down, and this is the inside in the cooler. And this is the uh, all-in-one um, cooling system. Now, this is basically came off of the egg cooler. This is what was sitting on top of the egg cooler. And what it basically consists of, it's got a fan up here with uh, some little radiator. It looks like a radiator, and that's exactly what it is. So it's the fan behind is blowing air across to uh, expel the heat out into the space that this is in and this is all the contraptions to do the compressing and then on the inside over here inside the cooler um, this is where the, again there's a fan down here blowing through the little radiator to blow the cold air inside the cooler there's a little controller here a thermostat controller for controlling temperature and then there's a little drip tube here to catch the condensate that drips off of this thing uh, and runs it out into the outside. Now it's it's not uh, perfect. We do have some drips. So you see, you see we've got a little pan here to catch the drips that uh, don't go down the tube. Um, we find that uh, you want to keep that tube open. You want to check it fairly regularly to make sure it doesn't get clogged and and uh, make sure the water is draining away. And then we have a pan just to catch the drips that don't uh, make it down the tube. Another good idea is to have a separate uh, instrument inside for recording temperature. Now what we do, this is a, it's a little temperature humidity gauge that uh, actually has a, a parrot to it outside the cooler so that you can see the temperature and humidity without having to open the door. So we actually have a chart where we record first thing in the morning uh, what the temperature humidity is and we then record it again at the end of the day to make sure everything's staying where we want it to be. Um, Okay, so now on to the third one. This was our, our large walk-in, large for us. Um, this is, again, about tripled in size of the one that I built, and uh, now we were able to hold product at the lower temperature. So we, we do not use the egg cooler anymore at all. We just use it for storage. Um, and then we use the, the one I built as, uh, for those warm season crops, and then this one here we use for the cold temperature crops cold storage crops. Um, you'll notice that it's outside. We did not have an inside space that was suitable to, to put it up in when we built it up. Um, it's on a base. Um, I, I built a little base to put it on. It does have an insulated floor inside, so it's, it, uh, it's separate from the, the floor that it sits on. It's got a separate insulated floor. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the features that we built uh, into this thing over the years um, a little bit later in the presentation. So this is what it looks like inside the cooler um, and outside the cooler. So I'm going to start over here on the outside. This is the, uh, the, the unit, the condenser unit basically. It's, it's similar to what you would have if you had an air conditioner outside your house. Uh, so this is where the, the work is happening where it's actually uh, doing the, the cooling and heating and there's a fan and again a little grill here for blowing the heat outside. There's an insulated pipe that's that's got the cold going in, and there's another one coming out that's got the hot coming out. And then inside the cooler, we've got this unit, which hangs. It's got three fans. Again, those will blow the cold air in. There's a drip tube again down here. I see a little drip tube down here um, to carry the condensation out. Um, and then over, over here, just this little gray box over on the side, that's the uh, thermostat where you can adjust the temperature. Um, and that's how that works. 
So I'm um, going to talk a little bit about uh, what we use for storing product in. Again, I talked uh, earlier about the, you want to not only do you have to worry about the temperature, but the humidity when you're storing product for any length of time. Um, so um, we accomplish that humidity control by doing a couple of different things. One is by using plastic tubs, and I'll show you. I've got a picture of that. Uh, these tubs are good for short-term storage. There's some dimensions of what they look like, or the size they are. Um, so we, we typically use the plastic tubs for product that, uh, for the CSA, when we harvest, we'll bring stuff in and we want to store it uh, maybe till the afternoon, then we do our, our pack out, or if we're storing it a day till the next day to do our pack out, we'll put it in the plastic tubs. Uh, they're easy to wash out, they're easy to sanitize, they've got a lid that snaps on. Uh, for longer term storage, we use the wax cardboard boxes, both the half bushel and the one and ninth bushel boxes. Um, there's some dimensions there, what they are and, and what they hold for cubic feet. And then again, for that humidity control, we use a box liner bag. Basically, it's a big, a, kind of a giant plastic bag. There's the dimensions in inches there, uh, and that's the number we get from associated bag. It's gusted, which means that the bottom is not all to one point. It folds out, so you, it folds flat against the bottom of the box. Uh, we use the same bag for both boxes. Um, we can put the product inside the bag and then we'll fold the top over um, so that we get a nice, uh, it holds the humidity on the product. How often should, we have a question, how often should the evaporator condensing coil be cleaned? I try to do that a couple of times a year, definitely in the spring when things are just starting to uh, get fired up. I'll go in and spray it out and to clean it, it's just a matter of like you do on your home uh, air conditioner, you take a hose and put the spray on it and just spray water both you know, from both directions to try to kind of flush everything out of the way. You want to make sure if any grasses or weeds have grown up that those are cut down so that uh, you've got uh, good ability for that hot air to be removed. Um, and then I tend to tend to get busy in the summertime. I often don't get it done until oh midsummer, later in the summer. Um, I'll clean it again, um, usually a couple of times, and that seems to work pretty well for us. Um, if you don't get it cleaned often, what'll happen is is you'll tend to uh, not remove heat uh, very well, and you'll find that it'll be running a lot. Um, it'll be constantly turning on and off, or it'll just turn on and stay on. Um, and if that happens where it comes on and stays on, then that's a clue that something's not right and you should start checking to figure out, you know, is it, is it dirty? Is it iced up on the inside? Icing is another problem um, that you can run into. There, there are coolers that uh, you can buy that'll have a heating coil that you can cycle on to, to get rid of any ice that's built up on the inside, um, on the fins on the inside. Ours does not have that. So uh, it, when if we have a little icing, uh, we'll what we'll do is basically take a hair dryer and we'll crawl up in there and uh, quickly get that that ice out of there and get it down and and that's typically the signal of when that is is when it's either running constantly is typically this the signal that something's not right so you got to do some checking. So here's some pictures of those again. There's our storage tub, the the clear tub that we use with the lid. Uh, the, the bushel boxes, half bushel and one and ninth, these are waxed cardboard boxes, so uh, they'll stand up to the water that you know, they may, if you happen to get some condensation inside the cooler, um, you, you, the box isn't going to soak up the water, it's a waxed cardboard, so it's food grade wax. Um, and then the box liner bag, that's a picture of the bag itself. Okay, so in terms of shelving, uh, that's a question that often gets asked, Do I, should I have shelves? And from our experience, um, you may have noticed in the one that I built, um, we have some shelves and those are removable shelves. Um, they're just wood slats that I put in that I can take out. Uh, and in here, and this is the inside of our, uh, our, our big cooler, our cold cooler. And again, it has shelves that uh, fixed to the side, those are removable. Um, if you're going to have some shelves, you want to make them easy to clean, you want them removable, and uh, it's helpful if they're water repellent because, again, you're in an environment where you're cooling uh, or making things really cold, and so especially in the humidity of the summer, um, if you open it up and you, know, you get that outside humid air inside, when you close everything up, that's going to condense out as it, as it cools off, and so you're going to have some water accumulate somewhere, and hopefully you know, it goes out the drip tube, but it doesn't always happen that way. Uh, how much does it hold? 
So it's basically a matter of math um, for those that love doing math. Um, basically, you, you uh, figure out uh, how much product you want to hold. You know, people will say, oh, how big do a cooler do I need? Well, the question is, how much product do you want to hold inside that? Um, for our big cooler, there's a, a picture of it full to the to the gills almost. Um, this is half bushel boxes inside there. So if we're just using the center aisle and say we have product on the shelves and I'm only using the center aisle, I just did the math. It's too wide. It's nine high, eight deep. It's 144 boxes I can put in the aisle way. Um, obviously, it's got to be something that goes in and out pretty often. This is you know CSA boxes in the picture that are going to be coming out. Um, just as fast as we put them in. Um, well, not just as fast, but within a day or, or two at the most. Usually it's only a day and we're moving them out once we've packed. Um, so, you know, if you block it up like this, you're not going to be able to get in to get to the other product. Um, if we're going to use the large one and ninth bushel boxes for our big cooler, um, all right, let me back up. I guess I'll go to talk about the plastic tubs. Typically, we only put those on the shelves in our cooler. We've got 14 shelves in there. If I can get two of those about per, per shelf, I can get 28 of those in there. <clears throat> that meets our needs for our CSA. For the waxed boxes, if I'm just filling the center, again, that's, that's kind of how many I can get in there, two wide, six tall, four deep. I can get 48. Um, and if I'm using the shelves, um, our, our big storage in the wintertime is carrots. We'll fill up the whole cooler with carrots. Um, I typically, we typically have found that we can leave our shelves in rather than taking them out and, and stacking. And I can get uh, well, a total of 90 there if you, if you follow the math there. Three on each shelf, 14 shelves, plus the ones in the middle. I can get 90 boxes. Um, you know, a one and a ninth bushel box is going to hold 40, 50 pounds of product, so I can get quite a bit of product stored in there. Okay, another question, the thoughts on maintaining clear and adequate flow, airflow inside the cooler. Um, so if you noticed on our, well, both of our coolers, you know, the airflow is going to be coming from those fans. Um, it's, it's, uh, you really need to be able to have enough airflow movement that you have good even, uh, you want to have a lot of volume of air. I guess that's the, question, the point I want to make. Um, so if you put boxes right in front of that all the way up to the ceiling, you're not you're going to you're going to kind of block that off. So product on the backside is not going to get the even cooling that you would have on the front. Um, so so what we tend to do is not we try not to go all the way to the top at least for not a very long period of time so that we've got ability for air to circulate on the backside. You'll notice on these boxes, there's a lot of holes in the boxes themselves. Those are on purpose. Those are designed that way so that you can get some airflow into the box itself and around the box from all different sides. Uh, so that'll help with that airflow. So yes, it's it's a good idea to to, to have that happen. When we walk in cooler, I have a switch with a pilot light so you can tell if the light is on without opening the door. Um, we do not have that, and I'm, I'm going to let Tony talk a little bit about that. I think he's, he's going to talk a little bit about lights when he gets to his section, so I'll, I'll kind of defer that one to him. And maintenance of the frequency of the door gassets and the hinges. Um, I'll be honest, we haven't, been, uh, we haven't done a lot with that. We've relied on the ones that are there. They're probably not ideal, and that's something that uh, it's, I've been thinking about, but I've never done anything about. Um, so I, I don't have a lot of uh, help there. Maybe Tony might when we get to him. Okay, a couple more slides and then I'll be done. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the materials that they're made out of. Um, again, you saw from our case we have one that's out of wood and one that's out of galvanized steel. Uh, the galvanized material is a much easier to clean and keep... Uh, you know, if you have some water condensation, it's easy to clean that up than it is on the wood. You don't have to worry about uh, mold and mildew that you would have in the wood. Um, Tony's going to talk a little bit about an air conditioner. Plus, I'm, what I'm talking about there is an air conditioner with a cool bot. We do not have experience with that type of system. Um, ours are both a commercial chilling system, and uh, and so I don't have a lot of experience with the with a cool bot. But I can tell you from, from our experience with the commercial chilling systems, um, they're very good at keeping things at a constant temperature. They, they do the job really well. Um, they, they also tend to use a lot of energy, though, so that's something to keep in mind. 
Uh, insulated slab, if you don't have a, uh, a floor that's insulated in your cooler, you're going to lose a lot of heat out the bottom of the cooler. It'll just conduct right through that floor into the ground. The ground is a great way to, uh, to suck away a lot of heat or a lot of cooling, whichever way you look at it. Um, so you want to make sure that uh, you've got some kind of a, whatever you're putting it on, it's, it's uh, isolated and it's, it's insulated. Um, inside or outside? I've gotten asked that question uh, different times. Uh, it depends on your situation. We didn't have an option. Uh, we didn't have a building we could put it in, so we had to put it outside. Uh, so a couple of things that we learned, um, you'll see here, I'll take my arrow down here. Um, there's a slanted roof. You can just see the, the dark outline back here. That's a roof, a second roof we put on the top of the cooler to direct the rain away. Um, it came as a flat roofed uh, cooler. And so like anything that's flat, you get some pooling when it rains. And eventually that would tend to seep in. So we put a uh, second roof on. It does two things. It, it, it directs the water away so I don't have any more leakage. And it provides some shade for the top of the cooler. Um, we also put this, this piece of tin up here on the front to kind of block that up uh, for the slanted roof. So again, we didn't get rain driving in on the top of the roof. Um, we have a building that's over here. You just kind of see the edge of. This is a building that uh, blocks the sun from the west side of the cooler. So that late day sun, we have just uh, we have most of the cooler that uh, doesn't get that exposure. And that's what I'm talking about is shading. Um, this picture was taken in the winter, so you see we have another building where you see a shade line here. Um, in the summertime, the sun is up higher in the sky, so that building is not really providing much shade. But you see some of the some of the trees that we have. This is shading from some of the trees, and obviously we don't have any leaves on the trees right now, so we get some shading from those trees, um, which is a good idea if you had that. So placement, you know, looking for a shady spot. Um, to, to keep that direct sun off of the bill, off of the structure itself. Another thing we learned uh, is the use of this reflective paint. This is a product that you can buy at any home improvement store. Um, it's it's uh, it's sold basically as a, it might be called an RV paint. Um, it's it's reflective. Um, so it basically uh, we learned this through a PFI project that we did several years ago where. Um, we were looking at trying to do improvements to the cooler itself and try to improve our energy efficiency. And uh, we found that in the spots where the sun was hitting it, it was warm to the touch. The galvanized material was actually, you couldn't touch it. It was hot during a sunny day. So by putting this reflective paint on, now you can hold your hand against that and you don't feel that sun beating down. It, it's amazing how well it reflects the, the, the heat away from the, the sun's heat away from the surface. So that's a good idea to have that on there and maintain it. Again, you're going to want to caulk up any of the, the leaks that you're going to have and then uh, you know, review that. Usually we try to do that annually, go around and repair any of those leaks that we might have, any gaps or leaks to, to keep the cold in. Power source, 110 versus 220. Again, it depends on what you have. Um, this cooler is a 220. The system runs off 220, so we had to have an electrician come out and uh, hook us up to get us 220. Um, it, it's a big energy user. Uh, it's our biggest single energy user on the farm, um, but again, it, it does an excellent job of maintaining the temperature and keeping things cold. Um, our internal one, the one I built, it runs on 110. So I'm getting behind on questions. Uh, okay, so I've talked about the outdoor and uh, the uh, ex exterior roof. Um, rotor control in the walk-in cooler. Um, we have never had an issue with rodent control. Uh, we've never had anything chew on it um, or try to chew through the wood. So um, obviously we do some rodent control in the building itself um, that we maintain as part of our, our you know, food safety plan. Um, but uh, we've never had an issue with that. How tall is the subfloor? It's about a six inch. Um, it came with the cooler, this floor. It's about six inches tall. How often do we paint? Um, we haven't had to repaint. Again, I did this as part of a PFI project, I think about three years ago now, maybe four, something like that. Um, and we have not had to repaint yet. It's lasted that long. So we'll find out. How easy is it to bolt together? It is extremely easy to bolt together. Um, basically, it's a big Allen wrench, and it's, uh, 
and you've got little sliding hooks that hook into the joining piece and uh, it was pretty it was just like it was pretty easy to put together when we put it together uh, it was helpful to have all the pieces identified of what went where I will say that um, that made it a lot easier special concerns for bio security with walk-in coolers um, not that we have really done I guess um, in our case we don't put a product uh, on the floor or if anything touches the floor that does not become a product that's going to be used anything that hits the floor is automatically goes to compost um, so you know in terms of cleaning the floor we will on occasion go through and mop it up um, and, and uh, you know clean up the floor because you will drag in some dirt you will have some water on the floor from time to time um, but everything that goes in the cooler um, we put in uh, in containers so that uh, so it the product itself never touches the floor Okay, and that's it for me and I uh, I'll actually I'll, I'm done. I'll turn it over to Tony Nice work Tim. Thanks so much. That was a great presentation uh, Tony. I'll pull yours up right now um, And then I'll let you take it over here All right. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Tim, I think you pretty much covered everything, so I'm not even sure that I need to talk, but because we've got some time, I'll go ahead and share some of my experience here. Just a, a quick background. I don't have uh, slides on my operation, so I'll tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from. In uh, 2013, I decided to come back to our family farm in Elkhart, so halfway between Des Moines and Ames in central Iowa, and see if I could uh, create a little additional value on our uh, primarily row crop farm by growing vegetables on a couple of acres. And so my first year on my own in 2014, I had a 25-member CSA, and then last year, 2015, Grew that up to a 60 member CSA. And one of the things I knew that I wanted to do was to not have a lot of outside or additional labor. So I did both, both these years primarily on my own. And one of the things that I knew that I would need, especially with the 60 member CSA, is uh, being able to harvest a day or two before delivery to deliver that quantity of produce. So going into me getting started, I knew that I wanted to have uh, ample storage space. And because of the way that our farm was set up, I had a very large existing structure into which I could build a walk-in cooler. And that's what I'm going to talk about with you here today. You've got my email address there, so feel free to contact me that way if you would like. If you have additional questions that come up later on. And with that, uh, what I can say is I have a, a lot of optimism when I take on projects like this. So I have really viewed it as a, a chance to sort of learn and experience and experiment and see what's going on and learn from the process. So that's what I'm going to share here. So this was built over the course of about a month in late winter, early spring of 2014. It's probably March, April time frame. Uh, getting ready for CSA deliveries in June, so I gave myself a little bit of leeway there. And I didn't multiply out the, the structure like Tim did, but I, a lot of space, like I said, so 8 foot by 16 foot and then 8 feet high. Gave me about 1,000 cubic feet, so that was uh, almost three times where Tim's largest cooler currently is. Um, so uh, lots of space. You'll see pictures here in just a minute. And I, I've not done a good job of estimating cooling costs. My best guess is that on the hottest summer days with my air conditioning set up, it was about a dollar a day. I think averaged probably more like 50 cents a day uh, season long. And I spent about $2,700 buying materials for this. You'll see that list later on. And then my best guess is that it was about 60 hours of my own time and a few extra hours of help in terms of construction. So with that in mind, let me step into it here. This is the building that it was going into. So you see it's a large uh, metal shell building that was originally built to store grain. Um, this provided nice space, plenty of shade 
uh, inside. And then I've got a, a, an existing hole in the building there where my air conditioner will uh, stick out here in a few minutes. And I'm also, I should say, that the, the cooler is built into the northeast corner of this building, so ideal, really, from a uh, lack of sun hitting uh, the walls and, and heating things up. This is just the other side of the, the northwest corner. So this is where I'm, the, the main entryway, there's now a garage door and a walkthrough door there on that, that end. And I, one of the reasons I say this is that the cooler being built in the east end or the back of that building, it gave me a lot of space for staging. So I could come in with muddy shoes, uh, set things on a table, switch shoes before going into my walk-in cooler. So it really helped me to keep the, the cooler clean. And uh, you'll see that I've got a, a wooden floor in that. So having that staging space was really helpful in, in that regard. Here is my, uh, my attempt at a blueprint. So what you're seeing is uh, the, the basic sketch, uh, 8 foot by 16 foot. The, let's see, the black on the, the perimeter of the, the vertical studs. The brown then are horizontal, the ceiling beams going across. Uh, the green, so between the studs, I used a fiberglass, uh, rolls of fiberglass insulation. And then the pink foam is it's the rigid foam, so four inch thick rigid foam facing the inside of the cooler. So just a couple of thoughts on that. Uh, in a setup like this, the vapor barrier is, is, is pretty important. So you'll have warm, uh, moist outside air trying to push its way into your cooler. Uh, the What you don't see here, there's actually a round of Tyvek, of a house wrap around uh, the outside of the, the fiberglass. So that kept the warm moisture out, and then the the rigid foam, the pink rigid foam, essentially keeps uh, moisture control on the inside of the cooler, so that that fiberglass insulation stays uh, stays dry. I'm trying to think, what else is coming up next? Let's see, Let's show some pictures on the inside. Again, having fun with this, I mean, uh, Steve asked me to have uh, blueprints for what I uh, what this was going to look like. And that last slide was basically the blueprints that I worked off of. So there was a lot of sort of making it up as I went along. Just from an engineering perspective, it's important that you know that that's my approach. I didn't have it, everything planned out with perfection. When I started this, it's very much sort of move forward and adapt as necessary. So with that, a um, few other thoughts. The walls themselves, here you're seeing a very early stage of construction. I used uh, two by sixes, and mostly that was for structural support. I happened to have uh, two by twelves on hand that I wanted to use as the, the horizontal uh, joists, the beams going across the top of the cooler so that I could then set heavy materials on top. So using 2x6s instead of 2x4s was an important consideration in that. Uh, on the floor, again, there's a concrete floor existing in this structure, so using treated lumber is important uh, for having that uh, cement contact. A few basic construction things. So here you see uh, there's a 2x12 header over the top of the cooler door, again, in line with keeping uh, strong support. On the ceiling, it's way overbuilt in terms of just holding the foam up, but again, in terms of wanting to set heavy things on the, the top of the cooler. And then, again, I was more concerned with being able to attach that rigid foam to the surfaces, so I wanted a smooth uh, surface on the ceiling. That's kind of one of the points of this slide. Then, again, I talked about the moisture barrier, so here we're pulling the Tyvek, this is my brother Cole pulling the Tyvek house wrap around the outside of the cooler. So we're inside of the, the existing structure, that's the 1x12s that you see on the wall in the background, but we're pulling Tyvek between the, the existing structure and the walls that we were building to, to insulate the cooler itself. Um, clearly we could have thought this through a bit more before we started by uh, 
<laughs> wrapping a bit more easily prior to putting the walls up. Here you see where uh, the fiberglass insulation is meeting. So the fiberglass insulation is already on the walls here, I believe. Oh, sorry, the fiberglass insulation here is already on the ceiling and the wall, the white with the two by sixes, you just see the wall. So again, Tyvek, the moisture barrier on the outside, then a, a roll uh, of fiberglass insulation. I think I used R11 or R13, whatever I could find uh, easily. And then on the inside of that will be the rigid foam. So again, a structure here's the last thing before putting on the rigid foam. Here's inside of the cooler looking out. Um, same kind of thing you're seeing, just the finishing touches of the fiberglass insulation being put on there. So then, often with rigid foam, you would use an adhesive caulk to attach it to the, uh, the the timbers, the lumber that you're framing to. I, because I was doing this for the first time and didn't want that level of permanence, I just used uh, long screws. So there's a six inch screw, again, to go through that four inches of rigid foam into the, the lumber behind it. And then a two inch fender washer, because the screws would obviously just pull straight through without that washer. Um, so I figure I've got some flexibility here. This, these rigid foam sheets are I think they're in the $50 a piece ballpark, so they're fantastic to build with, but they're quite expensive. And then here again, in the spirit of making things work as I went along, if you play around with the dimensions, you have a four foot by eight foot sheet of rigid foam. It's difficult to allow the overlap so I wanted the, the ceiling for example to overlap the walls by four inches so if my cooler interior dimension was eight feet wide it meant I had eight feet and eight inches to cover four inches on either wall side so I was left with this eight inch gap in the middle so I cut strips of rigid foam uh, pieced them up and then uh, sprayed with uh, an expanding foam just to fill that gap My solution for a door um, was to use actually an, an external, an insulated door, and then attach a piece of rigid foam to it. So you see that here. Let's see if I get to get the arrow. What you're seeing here is again the rigid foam on the inside of the cooler. The door swings inward. And that I felt like it was a, a pretty good solution. One aspect of this that I really like is that there's an overlap. So the door closes into the door jam, but then there's a six or eight inch overlap, which creates an, an extra thermal barrier there, prevents drafts. Uh, my solution for the door handle, however, was to simply cut a uh, six inch by six inch hole in the rigid foam. That allowed me to uh, reach in and use the original door handle. Maybe it's not the ideal solution, but it did prevent uh, any concerns about getting locked into the cooler. Here then is the, the right hand of the door. You just saw how the door swings open with the foam attached to it. Here's that extra lip that I was talking about. So the, the exterior door itself attaches, latches into the original jam, but then there's this six or eight inches where the rigid foam butts up against the wall and the other rigid foam and forms a pretty nice break. Of course, the downside of having four inches of foam attached to the back of the door is that that foam has to have some place to swing when it opens. So there was a little over four inch gap here on the back side of the door when it opens. Uh, it's not ideal, but because there's the, the Tyvek here provi providing the moisture barrier, and then there's fiberglass insulation on the other side of that moisture barrier, there's still a fair level of insulation here. I 
I think I uh, carried this presentation over from a previous uh, presentation and felt like I needed to add some humor just in case I was talking and droning on too long. Uh, so, of course, any uh, engineering fans out there will recognize this Engineering 101 flowchart where you solve problems with WD-40 or duct tape. And then moving on back to the cooler then. The... After the cooler was built, I guess there's one other thing I didn't say that I would like to say, and that's the floor. At one time, I, uh, existing concrete in the floor, I certainly knew that I wanted to insulate that. I was worried about being able to walk on top of this rigid foam. Uh, maybe some of you will remember a PFI discussion thread about that, uh, talking about compression. You know, if my 200 pound self was carrying a box of 50 or 70 pounds of potatoes or carrots or something into the cooler and I had all of that weight on one foot uh, would the the area of my foot be compressing would I be leaving footprints into uh, the rigid foam I think we decided that it would be safe however I went ahead and put three quarter inch uh, plywood on top of the rigid foam that is in the floor of the cooler I think that would be a fairly good way to go uh, provides just extra stability, it spreads the weight out a little bit. Then I pieced together some shelves out of two by fours just very quick. Um, used these plastic tubs then to store produce. I've got a couple of, of other coolers that I use for longer term storage. And again, remembering what my intent with this is, I am harvesting things and storing them in the cooler for one to two days, typically at the most. I might keep a few root crops in there for several weeks, but mostly things are coming in and out of the cooler fairly quickly. I uh, am not... Um, did I talk about the, the cool bot? Let's see if I have a slide on that. I don't know that I have a slide on the cool bot, but I'll show you in a second is uh, how that sits. I can mention the trouble light here, so there was a question earlier about lighting inside the cooler. I only used one relatively dim light, so it's a 12 watt fluorescent light bulb. I tended to leave it on, I just didn't have an easy, uh, easy access to wiring or uh, electrical for a light switch, so I left a 12 watt light bulb on, which of course from an energy standpoint wasn't ideal, but it's low enough I wasn't too, too worried about it. I mentioned earlier having the shell of this building to help reflect heat, and even additionally, uh, having the plants, the weeds grow up around it, I think uh, absorb some of that sunlight. So I'm actually using plants here to provide shade. And then you can start to see how the air conditioner is uh, sitting back, and of course keeping the weeds a couple of feet away from that to make sure that the air conditioner's got good flow so, so that it can function. See, there's a question about layer. Is there anything between the cement floor and the rigid foam? No, my rigid foam is sitting directly on top of the cement. So the rigid foam, I've, there's no concerns with it in terms of moisture. The foam itself is uh, works as a moisture barrier, so not concerned with that. So here again, just another view of the air conditioner from the outside. Let's see. You might be missing a picture here. But here's where we talk a little bit about the uh, the air conditioner that I use. So in the first summer, I had a 24,220 volt BT, uh, 24,000 BTU, 220 volt air conditioner that fit perfectly into that hole. So that's what I used. Then uh, that air conditioner conked out. It, I didn't get it new. Uh, it conked out uh, September the fall so I had to quickly replace it for my fall CSA shares and only could find a 12,000 BTU air conditioning unit that would fit into that hole in my building so I went ahead and got the half the size air conditioner I knew it would be okay going through the fall months I wasn't sure what would happen with the next summer but just to make it happen quickly I needed to do that um, 
again, I, with my engineering background, I did some fairly significant heat load calculations, and I assumed that as long as I wasn't bringing in lots of hot produce, as long as I either harvested early in the morning before there was a lot of field heat or used uh, some of the hydro cooling techniques that Tim talked about, I was comfortable with a smaller air conditioning unit being able to hold a temperature in that 38 to 42 degree range. So again, I'm not getting as cool as the 32 to 34 degrees that a uh, intentional uh, evaporator condenser coils could get down to like Tim has on his but 12,000 BTU air conditioner was certainly holding uh, this amount of space in the 38 to, to 42 degree range so if I'm reflecting on my experience couple of things that I can say, again, a great location in terms of being inside of this building, protected from the elements, including the sun. Uh, one thing I learned in terms of cutting four inches of rigid foam, if you uh, use a couple of long straight boards and then a, a hand saw using those edges of the boards, that worked much better than trying to cut through either free hand or scoring with a utility knife and cutting. Probably I could have thought through a bit more how to lay out the floor to the wall to the ceiling transitions with that rigid foam in order to have fewer cuts. Um, I, you saw a picture of that 8 inch gap that I had to fill. It works, um, not the prettiest. I think that first bullet point here is kind of what I just said. The second bullet point is what Tim was alluding to earlier in terms of having a multiple temp area. By, by hot summer times, I was sort of wishing that I had an area for warmer crops, tomatoes notably. Uh, my cooler was too cold for tomatoes and probably bell peppers when I was holding in that 32 to 38 to 42 degree range, but I needed that for the greens and the broccoli and those kinds of things. So my longer term intent has been to add uh, a second space for those warmer, uh, warmer crops. And I've not, in the, my two and a half years of <laughs> growing produce so far, had any interest in storing potatoes or onions or winter squash in uh, a cooler. Uh, probably I'd have better quality of those items if they were in that. Um, if they're harvested in the summer, certainly to, to hold them at a 60 degree or upper 50 degree range. Right now they just sit free in, in, the, in the barn space, which often gets up into the low 80s in the summer months. I should point out that I consider using Coolbot. I am, in fact, using a Coolbot. So that's, uh, that's what this is. That, that air conditioner, the thermostat, the minimum temperature on it, I think it's like 55 or 58 degrees. So I'm using a Coolbot, which essentially overrides the air conditioner's internal uh, thermostat in order to get it down to that 38 to 42 degree range. Just looking through my notes to see if there's any main points that I wanted to say. Um, this is the. Uh, <laughs> I forgot about this slide also. If you're uh, somewhere that can make things work, then you can probably make things work without all the, the, the perfect materials. That's very much what this project was all about. And then I'll uh, put up a materials list. I don't know how well you're able to see that, but I'll answer some questions then while, while this is coming up. So the, the rigid foam, the 4-inch rigid, rigid foam is R20. The fiberglass insulation is R13 or R11. Uh, I think I use different for the ceiling and for the walls. I don't know. I think when you get to that about the R20 range, probably for, for these purposes, that's enough. And so Chad's asking how important is that extra insulation in the walls. Um, my thought was that I'd rather have it over insulated rather than under insulated. And fiberglass insulation is relatively cheap. 
if I were to do it again and had less concern about the insulation, probably what I would do is continue to use the fiberglass insulation and then use two inch rigid foam instead of four inch just because of the cost savings. The two inch rigid foam would cost about half as much and the the foam itself was fifteen hundred dollars so to cut that cost in half would be a pretty significant savings. Thank you Tony. Great work. I guess I would just yeah, yeah I, mean, I always summarize in saying that this is, again, it's uh, me hacking things together. So if you're familiar with farm hack, here's a hack together walk-in cooler. It's a, a much different perspective than Tim that's been doing this for 21 years, but it's served my purpose as well. So, Steve, I'll turn it back over to you and we can take some questions. Yeah, I was just going to say um, that we've got plenty of time for questions for folks that want to get those in the chat box. Um, I will mention, too, that we, um, Tim, Tim alluded to the, the research that he's done uh, and data that he's collected. And so, um, like a lot of our farm owners, we do have some uh, research reports on our website that uh, do have some data that backs up some of this stuff. For instance, Tim was involved in a research project called CoolBot versus Commercial, commercial Chilling Systems and Walk-In Coolers. And uh, so I'm going to paste that in the chat box. Uh, you, can, you can read this at a later time. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and jump in and ask, answer a question or two, if that's all right. Yep. So the Great. Chad's asking about moisture barriers on both sides, and I consider this having moisture barrier on both sides because the Tyvek is a moisture barrier on the outside, but then the rigid foam uh, sealed into itself with either the expanding foam or with, uh, with caulk. So both were airtight and moisture tight. Angela, in terms of an uneven asphalt floor and an old barn, <laughs> I think just get creative with it would be my... Uh, certainly you could build it up with... Um, build a frame, a perimeter that was level and then use floor joists. And that would also give you a thermal break then from an old asphalt or concrete floor. Tim? Tim, you want to take Ben's question? Yeah, I noticed. Okay, I'm back on. All right. Yep. There you go. <laughs> All right. So um, the plastic fl plastic flaps on the outdoor cooler doors. Um, that's a thought. Um, we have not done that. Uh, just from the standpoint of um, the cooling capacity we have in that that outdoor cooler. Um, yeah, we do drop the temperature a little bit. Um, we've done some work, again, through PFI on setting up some temperature monitors, um, both inside and outside on the surface, and we showed that, uh, yeah, you do pick up some heat when you open the doors to pull stuff in and out, but it pretty quickly cooled back down, um, so we didn't do that. We do use the plastic flaps and other places on the farm, um, like in our packout shed, the door that we use, bring product in and out of on the packout shed. So I'm familiar with those, but uh, didn't feel we really needed them with the cooler because it cooled down so quickly um, with that cooling system. Yeah, and Tim, while we, while um, we got you there, Laura's question about how big is your air conditioner? Do you know that? Well, that would be for Tony. I mean, oh, you mean on on my system? Um, I couldn't tell you. I do not know that. Um, I hired a contractor to come in, and uh, when we bought the the cooler, the the bolt together cooler, um, it did not come with a uh, with a compressor system. Um, the inside, the fan system was there, but it did not uh, have the compressor. So we had to buy a new one. So that uh, when we when we bought it, we we I hired a contractor to put in to size it accordingly, and I couldn't tell you how big that is, how many BTUs. Sorry. I can take the question about a heat source on a thermostat in late fall. Yes, I did do that. My heat source was a hundred watt light bulb, as well as the fan 
in the air conditioner itself. So I, I kept the, the air conditioner fan running just to keep a little bit of air movement inside of the cooler even in the, the, through, through January. Uh, and that fan together with a 100 watt light bulb was enough to keep my cooler from uh, above, I don't know, it's in that 35 to 36 degree range throughout the winter months. I'm going to jump in on that also because um, we have also added a heat source. Um, on, we're storing potatoes in our inside cooler, our, our cool cooler, through the winter, usually moving potatoes. Um, well, we just moved the last of them here uh, a week ago. And same thing on carrots. I'm We're storing carrots through the winter months and moving those. Um, again, just moved the last of those last week. Um, so when we have a, a cold space um, where it's down below zero or even down in the negatives, um, we have set up a little uh, heater, just a, a little portable heater uh, on the low setting inside the cooler because uh, we will, um, you know, if it's, if it's uh, say, you know, down in the single digits or below zero on the outside temperature, eventually that cold will seep through because the, the, the inside compressor is not running at all um, because there's, it's colder outside than it is inside. So we have had to put a little heat source in there. So I just run, a, a, just run an extension cord under the door and put a little heat in there. Um, again, it seems kind of counterintuitive. You're adding heat. And then, um, you know, it'll obviously, that'll cause the compressor to kick on again to, to, to pull it back down because it's a continuous, um, and we, you know, the little milk house heater cycles on and off, but it's still, um, if you're going to store product through the winter, that's kind of the way it works. Um, you're going to have to have a little heat to keep things from freezing. The source of our bolt together cooler, um, we actually, uh, where did we get it? We got it um, from a friend of ours who had bought a bigger cooler and had taken it apart. So uh, it wasn't like I got it commercially. I got it from a, from a fellow farmer. So it was kind of a, a luck of being in the right place at the right time. And um, I know that's probably not real helpful, but that's how it worked for us. Okay, it looks like uh, another question in here is from John Paul that he says, I've acquired a bunch of panels, missing corner pieces and no door, etc. Any thoughts or pointers on construction? And it's kind of a big question, but I know maybe uh, maybe Tony has some thoughts on that. I know, Tony, you used, I'll pull this slide up again, for your door. You just had an exterior door that you bought secondhand, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and... So, uh, Right. I don't know if you have any any thoughts for John Paul on what he'll need there. I really don't. I haven't worked. With, I, you know, I've seen the panels that that Tim used to construct. I assume John Paul's got something similar, but I am not familiar enough with with them. If it's something that you can kind of piece together and you know use lumber in the corners and make work, or I, I, I don't know. Okay, um, Tony. Looks like there's another couple questions in there. One from Angela, uh, and then another yep. from Chad. Um, why did I want the ins rigid insulation to extend four inches past the edge? It wasn't past the edge. It was four inches of overhang above the walls. So I think what I did was to have the the four by eight sheets laid out four across to make it eight foot by sixteen foot on the ground. And then I had the option then, do I put the walls, the wall panels on top of that, or do I put the wall panels, uh, the four inch piece on the floor, four inch width <laughs> on the floor, uh, making the outside of the cooler eight foot and eight inches. So that's that eight inch gap. It's not that it's past the edge, it's just that there's an overlap above and below the, the wall panels. Um, I'm not sure if you take some material that's got width to it and try to piece together the, the cooler box. That's essentially what I was trying to do. And then Chad, a two-inch foam board, I think, 
I think it's exactly half the price of the four inch foam board. So Steve's got my slide back up. If those uh, four inch foam panels were sixty two fifty each, then I, I think two inch would be thirty one and a quarter. At least it would have been three years ago. So it would have saved seven hundred fifty dollars on the the whole cooler construction costs. I don't know that it would have changed any of the other construction costs. Great. Well, I don't see any more questions in the chat box. Tony or Tim, do you guys have anything else to add that you intended to? Unless you guys are real I would just say tonight. thanks. A lot of uh, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity, and uh, thanks for for. Letting me chuck your off for a while. <laughs> yeah, good luck, everybody. Uh, if there's anything that we can do, I think Tim and I are both on the uh, Hort discussion list. Can answer questions there or directly via email. Looking forward to hearing everybody's success stories. Yeah, nice plug there, Tony, for uh, join PFI, <laughs> become a member, get on our discussion list, and keep this keep this conversation going. Um, big thanks to Tim and Tony for taking the time for these presentations, guys. These are great, uh, really useful. And if anybody wants to share this or rewatch it, I'll send you a, a link tomorrow or the next day or so uh, with the archived version of this. So thanks everyone for tuning in, and thanks to our presenters.